I'd like to take a look at the way that the halacha and the Torah itself was given and transmitted through the generations till now. And the most traditional um, narrative that we think of, that, that we're raised with, is very simple. The entire Torah was given at Har Sinai. God gave it to Moshe, and Moshe brought it down and gave it to the people. And we've been transmitting it, remembering it, trying to teach it and preserve it since that time until today. And this narrative is straightforward. It's, it's rooted in many sources. For example, Torah Tzivalana Moshe. Moshe taught us the Torah. Moshe taught us the entire Torah and transmitted it to us. One interesting demonstration of this is relatively well known. The first Pasuk in Parshas Bahar, God says to Moshe and teaches him the laws in that case, beginning with Shemitah. And the Torah says that God told it to Moshe, Behar Sinai. God spoke to Moshe at Har Sinai and taught him these laws. And of course, that's why the parsha is called Parshas Behar. But Rashi asks the rather obvious question um, in a way that became an idiom. Ma inyan Shemitah eitz Har Sinai. Why on earth does the Torah have to mention Har Sinai in particular with this one of the 613 mitzvos, which doesn't happen in the Torah regarding all the rest of the mitzvos. Usually it's just Vaidaber Hashem El Moshe Lemor. God spoke to Moshe and taught him these laws. Why is it that here it's necessary to mention that God taught it to Moshe at Har Sinai? And Halo Kola Mitzvos Nemru Misinai. Ella, rather, the reason is this. The Torah specifies, in the case of Shemitah, that every detail of the law was given at Har Sinai, because it says explicitly, Har Sinai, and then the Torah goes on to list all the halachot. This is a, teaching us a paradigm that in all cases, even when the Torah doesn't specify it, Every detail of every law was given as Sinai, Kachshnuya B'Taras Kalanim. This is how the Midrash understands the Pasuk. And the thing that we should notice is that what's overly obvious to Rashi isn't necessarily obvious to all, because it's possible that some of the mitzvahs were taught later than Har Sinai. The Torah, the Chumash, wasn't given to Moshe, rather the Luchot, the tablets were given at Har Sinai, and the Torah was given, according to the Gemara, it was written either throughout the years of the desert or at the end of the desert. But here Rashi assumes that it's self-evident that every mitzvah, at least every mitzvah, maybe not the narratives of the events that happened after the um, after Har Sinai, but all the mitzvahs, every detail was given at Sinai because... That's the source of the Torah. The Rambam takes this um, very extremely and very um, seriously because the Rambam codifies the halacha that all Jews are entitled to a portion in Olam Haba. All Jews are, will receive a portion in the world to come with a few exceptions. And one of the exceptions that are kofrim, people who reject the Torah. And what are the kofrim? So the Rambam explains that there's a couple of kinds of kofrim. One is someone who says that the Torah is not truly from God, but Moshe made up the Torah or part of it or even one letter. If a person believes that Moshe innovated and thought of something in the Torah and he added it or changed it, this is a kofrim who violates the core belief of Judaism and therefore has no portion in the world to come. Um, similarly, someone who, in, who rejects the interpretations of the Torah Shabbat Peh, or who says that something was changed about the Torah from the time that God gave it till we have it today. So we see that the belief in the authenticity of the Torah, every detail of the Torah, the belief that everything that we have today in terms of the
the mitzvot are exactly how God gave it at Sinai um, is central to, to our belief system. And finally, um, I want to just look at a couple of midrashim that amplify the same theme as well. The Midr- the Gemara says in Maseches Megillah, "My dechsev alehem that on them the luchot kechol advarim asher diver Hashem imachem b'har." What are all the things that God spoke to Moshe at Har Sinai? Melamed sheherehu hakadosh baruch hu l'Moshe. This teaches us that Mo- that God taught Moshe or showed Moshe diktuke Torah, diktuke sofrim, umasha sofrim asid l'chadesh. All innovations that will be innovated by the Chachamim throughout the generations, were told to Moshe originally at Harsinai, Umayneyu, what's this a reference to in context, Mikra Megillah. Similarly, the Midrash says that Afilu Masha Talmud Shoah Larav, even not only the laws and the details and the Takanot and the decrees of the rabbis, but every question that any student will ever ask his teacher God told Moshe. In other words, nothing is new in the Torah. Everything is authentic, was communicated to Sinai. Maybe something was forgotten and then remembered, but everything that's truly part of the Torah, even the questions that we have, um, let alone the answers, were all given from God to Moshe at Sinai. Truly, Torah tziva lanu Moshe. The Torah was taught through Moshe. But there are some challenges to this, to this idea, and one of the earliest comes from an, an, an account that the Talmud uh, tells about um, a certain convert who came to Hillel and Shammai. Masa bin Nachri Echad Shabalif Shammai. A Gentile came to Shammai. Amarlo, and he said to Shammai, how many Torahs are involved in Judaism? Amarlo Shtayim. So, so, um, so, Shammai said there's two. Torah Shvichsav, the Torah Shabalpe. The written Torah and the oral Torah. Amarlo Shvichtav, Anim Amincha, I believe in you about the Torah Shvichtav. Everyone re- believes that the Bible is written by God. Shabal peh eni ma'min I don't believe you that there's such a thing as an oral Torah. Gaireni almanach etalamdeni Torah shvichtav. I want you to convert me with the understanding that you'll teach me the written Torah. So Shammai was appalled. I'm going to convert someone who doesn't accept the cornerstone of Judaism. Gar Bovo Siyub Nazifa Shammai rejected this possibility. <laughs> then Balifne Hillel Gaire. Then this person came to Hillel, Hillel converted him. Hillel said, Okay, I'll take what I can get. You believe in Torah Shbiksav, we can convert. Yomakama, the first day subsequently when Hillel was going to teach him the Torah. Omar Lay Aleph Bez Gimel Dalid. So Hillel said, you know. Let's start from the beginning. This is an Aleph, and this is a Bez, and this is a Gimel, and this is a Dalet. Lamachar Apichle. The next day, Hillel said, well, no, actually, this is the Aleph, and this is the Bet, and this is a Gimel, and this is the Dalet. Amrle, so the student says, Yesterday, you didn't say it like this. Amrlo. Lav alai didi kasamchis dal penami Oh, so you're actually going to interpret the Torah based on the way I explain it to you? If you if you believe in the rabbinic explanation of the Torah, so you should also believe in the Torah Shabbat Alpeh. And it's a fascinating story. And Hillel um, is demonstrating a couple of differences with Shammai. One is his attitude towards this. Um, person, whether we think we can work with um, a partial acceptance and develop more down the road, or we need a more full commitment at the beginning for conversion, is one issue. The other issue is that Hillel thought that he has a way of convincing him. If you accept the Torah Shabbat, so based on that, I could convince you that if you're going to accept the Torah Shabbat, by definition, 
you have to believe in the Torah Shabbat Peh. Because essentially, what Hillel is arguing is that you can't even read the Torah Shabbat unless you believe in an oral tradition. At the least, what the letters actually sound like. You know, maybe, you know, Lamed Aleph really stands for Cain, and whenever the Torah says not to do something, it means that we should do it. So Hillel is basically demonstrating an, an, an argument, a logical argument, that if you accept the Torah Shabbat it's implicit that you accept the Torah Shabbat Peh, and therefore um, Hillel worked with that. The, the other thing that this Gemara demonstrates is that the skepticism about the authenticity of this oral tradition was an old challenge. At least from the time of Hillel and Shammai, if not earlier, there were people who were doubting the authenticity of the Torah Shabbat Peh, despite the fact that Chazal had these very strong statements about how it was all taught at Sinai, and the Rambam has a strong statement about the importance of the belief in the Torah Shabbat Peh. In fact, it's possible that the Rambam and the Midrash were speaking in strong terms because of the fact that they already knew that people were challenging this assumption that everything comes from Sinai. Perhaps the most vivid demonstration of this of this question is the story of Rabbi Akiva. Because the Midrash in, in the Gemara Menachos tells us that Bishash ala Moshe Lamarom when Moshe went to Har Sinai, so Moshe came up to get the Torah, to bring it down from Sinai, and he noticed that God was sitting and tying on these little crowns above the letters of the Torah. So Moshe says to God, You know, what is this all about? So Moshe, uh, God responds to Moshe, Adam echad yesh she'asid liyos pesov kamadoros. There's going to be a person who will be born in a number of generations from now. V'akiva ben Yosef Shemo, and his name is Akiva. She'asid lidro shall call kotz for kotz, who ultimately will interpret every little crown, every part of each crown. Tilin tilin shal halachos. He will see many halachos implied in each crown, and he will interpret them. And although you don't understand it, it will be understood in the future. And for that, I am writing them in the Torah. Moshe says, wow, extraordinary. Could you please show me this individual? Turn around into the time machine. So Moshe went, and he was in the eighth row of the classroom of Rabbi Kiva. And he was disheartened because of the fact that he didn't understand what was going on in his classroom. Ultimately, they come to a certain point and they say, Rabbi, what's the source of this halacha? We don't see any obvious psukim that tell us this halacha. So Rabbi Kiva responded and said, well, in fact, there is no source for this particular halacha because it's a tradition in the oral tradition dating back to Moshe Rabbeinu and Arsinai. Nityashva dato, so Moshe Rabbeinu felt a little better. Moshe says, you have such an extraordinary uh, scholar at your, at your disposal. Why are you choosing to have me Bring the Torah to the Jewish people. Amarlo shtok. So God told Moshe to be quiet. Kach This is my decision, and this is what I decided to do. In this story, we can really understand and appreciate what was going on over here. And it's almost a joke that people say if Moshe Rabbeinu would see the Torah that we have today, he wouldn't recognize it. Indeed, that's what Chazal say when Moshe did see the Torah of today, or at least um, much later than his time, he didn't recognize anything in the Torah. What are these halachos, or these chumros, or these gezeros, or these interpretations that I never would have even imagined? Moshe doesn't recognize his own Torah. And Chazal suggests this. Chazal themselves, the, the ones who innovated and, and decreed and interpreted 
all of the aspects of the oral tradition are the ones who themselves said that Moshe Rabbeinu, in this metaphoric story, didn't actually recognize the Torah that he was studying from Rabbi Akiva, uh, let alone 2,000 years after Rabbi Akiva. Um, this, this story really amplifies the question of could we actually believe literally that every single thing was given at Mo, to Moshe Rabbeinu at Sinai and transmitted intact to the way we have it today? And is that really the cornerstone belief of the Torah? What is the source? How do we even know that there is an oral tradition other than the fact that the rabbi said so? And the reason why this is a question is because there's no pasuk in the Torah which says, follow the oral traditions. There's very, very vague references to the concept of an oral tradition. And in the Kuzari, when the Chaver um, in the Kuzari is trying to argue and advocate for the belief in the traditional understanding of Torah, um, I brought a sort of short ex uh, excerpt here, but he's also addressing the same tradition of rejection of the oral tradition. And he has a lengthy response, but here's one excerpt. Hayisi wrote, maspeket al I have the following question that I'd like to pose to the Karaites who reject the oral tradition. And if you'll answer my question, I will accept that you're correct and I will become one of you. I want you to answer the question that I have to pose. How do we know exactly if you think that the Torah was written as a written book, closed book, with no additional explanation, no body of an explanation? How on earth is it possible to interpret the Torah? It's vague. It says you should um, you should slaughter animals in a particular way, but it never tells you how to do it. Who would tell it to you? How can the Torah impose penalties on those who don't follow the laws of the Torah, and yet the Torah itself doesn't explain what actually the laws are? You know, what is... Um, um, how do you do... Um, how do you do, how do you know which fats, the Torah says you can't eat certain fats, how do we know which fats are prohibited? The Torah says don't do work on Shabbat, otherwise we get the capital punishment. But what defines melacha? The Torah in the, in the written text never explains these things. So how on earth could we su suggest that the Torah was written to be read only as it's written if the Torah itself doesn't explain itself? And just one example that the Kuzari referred to is rather compelling, in my opinion, because the Torah says, when you want to eat meat, we know that you can eat a korban. Let's say you, you don't have a korban and you want to eat just ordinary meat. So the Torah says, no problem. Eat your, um, slaughter zavachtas, slaughter your animals, ka'asher tziviticha, in the way that I commanded you. And then you may eat it. And the Torah says, slaughter it the way I commanded you. But the thing is, when you look through the Chumash, there's no other place where the Torah describes how we're commanded to eat the, the uh, slaughter animals. So what is the Torah referring to when it says, Kasha Tivisicha? So Rashi says, Lamanu so that this implies that there is some sort of command. How to do shechita. And where is that? This must refer to a body of oral explanation that was given at Sinai accompanying the Torah. So personally, I think this is a rather compelling source. But even if they'll accept it as a compelling source, it's not explicit. It's an implication. It's not explicit in the Torah that... There's this halacha l'moshe misinai, and it's really easy to understand why people have challenged this, this view, and easy to understand also the the anecdote with Rabbi Akiva and Moshe Rabbeinu, where it's unclear whether the Torah that we have today is actually identical 
to the Torah that Moshe understood from Sinai. And and one one last important anecdote in the Gemara is critical in addressing this question. And that is the famous story of Tanosh Shalachnai, which is a particular kind of an oven where the Chachamim were debating whether this oven has the ability to become Tame. And Rabbi Eliezer debated all of the Chachamim. And the the Gemara quotes this account, but also Ayom Heishi Rabbi Eliezer, Kol HaTshuvo Shaba Olam. Rabbi Eliezer gave all the answers in the world. Velo Kiblu Heimenu, and they didn't accept it from him. Amr Lehem Im Halacha Kimoti, he said, if the halacha is like me, charuv zayochiach, this carob tree should prove me correct. Nekar charuv mimkomo mea ama. The carob tree was uprooted and transplanted 100 amos, about 150 feet over. It jumped, it flew, miraculously. Some say 400 amos. Amrulo, the chachamim responded, Ein mevin raya min a A carob tree is not an authority on halacha. And they rejected it and didn't care. Chazer vi amr lehem, and then he said, Im halacha kimoti, amar hamayim yochichu, this spring of water should prove my point. Chazer amas hamayim lachareim, this water that was flowing, did an about face and turned around and, fl- and started to flow the other way. Amru lo eim evi in raya meyamas hamayim, a spring, um, doesn't know, isn't an authority of halacha. That's not a proof. The um, walls of the Beit HaMedrash should prove me correct. He too, Kotzle Beit HaMedrash, so the walls began to fall. Garbo Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Yeshua, Attack the walls. If the Chachamim are in the middle of a dispute, why are you getting involved in this conflict? You have no right to fall down and to topple the Beit HaMedrash just to prove a point about that the sages were debating. They never fell down because of their respect to Rabbi Yeshua, and they didn't stand straight upright because they wanted to support Rabbi Yezer. And these are the leaning walls of the base that are still tilted. Rabbi Yezer says, you don't want to listen to the walls, you don't want to listen to the water, you don't want to listen to the carob tree. Listen to God himself. A voice emanated from heaven and said, what do you have, what, what, why are you debating with Eliezer? He's correct. God Himself came to support Rabbi Eliezer. Ahmad Rabbi Yeshua Raglav, Rabbi Yeshua stood up and said, Lo Bashamayimhi. It's not in the heavens. My Lo Bashamayimhi, Amar Rabbi Yirmiya Shekvar Nisna Torah Meir Sinai. That the Torah was in the heavens, but then God gave it down to Moshe at Sinai. God released his control over the Torah in the hands of the people. And in the Torah, God said, that we should follow the words of the Chachamim. And as a postscript, the Gemara tells us, Rabbi Nasan asked Eliyahu Hanavi, My Ovid Kuchabrichu Bahishaita, what was God doing? At this moment, Amar le kochayech vi Amar nitzchuni banai nitzchuni banai. God was happy and smiling and saying that my children have have succeeded me, have have defeated me. In the positive, he was proud of the accomplishments of his children. So, what emerges from this Gemara? What emerges from this Gemara is. The notion that, similar to the story of Rabbi Akiva, that the Torah is not necessarily a pristine um, body of knowledge that was memorized and transmitted, but rather God gave it over to people. Loba Shamayimi, He gave it to the people not just to remember it, but also to figure it out on their own and to establish the halacha on their own. And ultimately, 
Moshe Rabbeinu might not recognize the Torah that, of Rabbi Akiva, because maybe Moshe Rabbeinu learned from God that, the, that Rabbi Leezer was really correct. But the Jewish tradition became that we follow Chachamim. Or in, all, in, in the myriad of cases of ambiguity and debate and innovation, Chachamim have, were, were empowered by God with the responsibility to interpret the Torah, to innovate, to make takano decrees according to certain um, objectives that the Torah states to pre- create a mishmeret le mishmarti. And the Torah might have actually changed over time and might not be exactly the way originally it was. And even though there are ample sources that we saw earlier that that emphasize the fact that um, that every single thing was told to Moshe at Sinai, even every question, it's possible that this is meant literally, but it's also possible that the point of these Midrashim is to say that every bit of Torah is as authentic as if God would have told it literally word for word at Sinai. But it's authentic because God empowered the people with the responsibility to create these interpretations, and those interpretations are true, are MS La Mito Shal Torah, because they were developed according to the structure which the Torah put in place and instructed the people to follow. And there's a beautiful Midrash which um, really takes this position. That the Midrash tells of, a, um, of one of the Chachamim who was walking and he encountered a person who came and challenged me. Who said, I believe in the Torah Shabbat and not the oral tradition. A familiar position. I tried to explain to him that they're both from, the to- from Sinai. Let me give you a parable. A parable. Imagine a king who has two servants. He loved them incredibly. Give them each a measure of wheat. And they each got a bundle of flax seeds. The wise one, what does he do? Not all the pishtan va argal mapa. He takes the seeds and he weaves it, the fibers, into a tablecloth. Not all the va san solos. He takes the wheat and he grinds them into flour. Birira tachana lasha va afa. He um, sifted it, grinds it, kneads it, and bakes it into bread. The sidra gabe shulchan puts it on the table. Parasle mapa puts the cloth over it. And left it there till the king returns. The tipesh, the other servant, did nothing, kept it intact. He comes and he tells the two servants to bring out what they have, what they have. One takes out the table with the bread. And the other one takes out the box with the wheat and the, and the flax seeds. Woe is to the shame and embarrassment and disgrace of the servant. Which one is more precious? Um, clearly, what this king would want was to take the materials that he gave them and to develop them and to improve them. And this is what the Midrash says is what the Torah Shabbal Peh is all about. So, yes, it's possible that the Midrash mean literally that everything we have today is exactly word for word as God gave it at Sinai. But it's also possible that, at least according to some Midrashim, that it's not quite that literally, and the point is that it's authentic and real and true, but it's actually innovated and changed 
through the structures which God gave at Sinai. It's, the Torah is interpreted through the Midos Shaton Nidrashas Behem and is innovated through the structures of the way that God instructed us to create Xeros, etc. But really, they're man-made. And even though God is greater than man, of course, the Torah is no longer in the heavens and was given over to man who was charged with this responsibility and opportunity. And the one question this leads to is, if this is all the case, what was the reason why God chose to structure the Torah in this way. And, and it seems obvious that it's because he wanted to empower us to create our investment in the Torah. And one midrash that, that, dem- that, bear- that bears this out is the midrash on the Pasuk, when Moshe was told to chisel um, a second set of tablets where the word lecha for you. And the Midrash says, almost humorously, Lohashir Moshe Ella me Psolas and Shaluchos, that Moshe became wealthy because of the Psolas, because of the chiseled um, stones from the Luchos. Shinamar Psalacha, Shinluchos Avanim Kavishanim, Psolasan, Shalacha Yehe. That the, whatever's carved that came out was for Moshe to keep. And therefore, Moshe kept these precious stones of the Luchos. And um, while it seems to me, you know, um, hard to understand why the Midrash is focusing on Moshe's financial situation after the Luchos, but it seems to me what the Midrash is getting at is that Moshe took an ownership over the Luchos. And that's what the Torah Shabbat is all about. It's about giving the people ownership and partnership over the Torah so that we care about it because it's ours. And and one last, one last question I want to raise is, if it's the case that the Torah is constantly evolving and improving through our innovation and getting better and better, why is the why are Chazal constantly referring to ourselves as lesser than previous generations and the tradition as more authentic than it was in the past? And I think the answer to that final question is really goes to the core of what the Torah is all about. And that is that we know that Moshe Rabbeinu's um, primary quality was that he was anav. He was humble. He was, he didn't think high of himself. And of course, humility is a virtue, and Moshe is a great Jewish leader, so why not say that Moshe had this virtue? But I don't think it's just a virtue, but I think it's the virtue that made Moshe the one who was fitting to receive the Torah, because what is the Torah if not an acknowledgement that there's a force greater than ourselves? What is religion if not for the fact that it's a belief in God, in a force greater than ourselves? And I think that Moshe's humility is the prime reason why he was chosen to be the one to bring the Torah to the Jewish people. Just as we know that Har Sinai, according to the Midrash, was the smallest mountain, because in the same way, the humility of the mountain and the humility of the person on the mountain are the essence of what the Torah really is. And therefore, I think that despite the fact that we see the Torah in certain ways as evolving and improving based on our own efforts, it's the most important thing about learning Torah is developing a sense of humility and a sense of realization that there's something greater than ourselves. And that's what the Torah is most interested in developing, despite um, or balancing this important role that we're given, but at the same time recognizing our smallness next to God and hoping that Torah will actually cultivate that humility and that awareness and deepen our connection to God.